Okay, so we're going to start up again with the last two talks of day one. Our next speaker is Alan Jacobson. Alan Jacobson, in 1982, along with Stuart Peltz, formed a company called PTC Therapeutics. And I'm happy to tell you that that company has a drug focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and I think he's going to tell you that story. Okay, so I first met Larry in 1968 at the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Protein Synthesis. And I have this vivid memory of this uh, talk he gave. It wasn't the data. It had nothing whatsoever to do with the data. But it had to do with the fact that as soon as he finished his talk, two really attractive young women came up and gave him big hugs and kisses and a bouquet of flowers. And I've been trying to learn stuff from Larry ever since. So, <laughs> ah, thanks, Larry. Um, okay, so um, the talk I'm going to give you today uh, starts out with this background stuff here. This is not George Bush's genome sequence. The, the, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that's it. Uh, so uh, these are the three nonsense code words in the genetic code. And I'm going to tell you how a basic science uh, project trying to understand more about what they did in the gene expression pathway led us to uh, developing a drug to treat uh, fatal inherited disorders. Okay? And this is a project that I uh, uh, started both in the basic science side and in the clinical side with a long-term collaborator, Stuart Peltz. Okay, so um, for Tom, we've got RNA. Uh, so we all know the, uh, the central dogma of molecular biology. Information in DNA is copied into RNA, and that serves as a template for protein synthesis. And inside the cell, uh, that all happens on something called a polyribosome, and um, an RNA that gets transcribed in the nucleus and transported into the cytoplasm, um, gets connected with ribosomes and a lot of factors, and uh, in the process of translational elongation, we make a full-length polypeptide, and it is these completed polypeptides, these proteins, that do an awful lot of the business of the cell. Now, the information for the specificity in these polypeptides comes from the genetic code, and these are all 64 of the code words in the genetic code. 61 of them uh, lead to insertion of a specific amino acid, and three don't. The so-called nonsense codons, or stop codons, um, provide punctuation. Punctuation that says, this is the end of the information from this particular gene. And the code word AUG is the start code word, providing the punctuation that says, start here. Now, punctuation is important. And from my favorite methods manual, uh, Julia Child, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, we can see the importance of punctuation. So she says, and here's the start, and here's the stop. She says, decorate the roast with watercress or parsley, and be sure to serve the lamb on hot plates, as lamb fat congeals when cold. But if we had a premature stop, okay, decorate the roast with water, all right? This, this is a problem, all right? And so if you only have partial instructions, okay, uh, you, you have a problem. And so this illustrates uh, for the, the non-scientists in the audience the consequences of a premature stop. In the process of gene expression, um, we call these termination codons as well. And if you have a premature termination codon, you only get a fragment of the full-length polypeptide that you ordinarily would. And that has dire consequences because a partial fragment is essentially uh, non-functional. And the gene from which that comes is essentially a non-functional gene. Okay? And so the genes that have these premature termination codons okay, have what are called nonsense mutations and they lead to this premature stop. Now, why should you care? Okay? 
You should care because there are almost two and a half thousand different genes where nonsense mutations lead to disease. And I deliberately made this too small for you to read. Okay? It, uh, the sense was to leave you with the magnitude of the problem. Okay? And, and our estimate of 2,400 may be low. Uh, the Nord office thinks that maybe it might be 4,000 genes. Uh, the important point is that, on average, all genetic disorders are caused uh, by nonsense mutations about 15% of the time. So that's a lot of patients. And so this is an important problem to worry about. Okay. So we started thinking about this uh, when we were working on yeast uh, a while back. And we were interested in trying to know whether or not translation termination was as simple as advertised. Because when we started, it was thought that all you needed was a simple termination codon present in a messenger RNA and two proteins, two release factors as they're called. And that no matter what, that would be sufficient to give you absolute termination of protein synthesis at that site. Well, it turns out that's too simple. Okay? Uh, translation termination turns out to have been much more complicated. Okay? And for example, uh, the first way that we realized how much more complicated it was, was when we started looking not at the consequences of the protein, but on the messenger RNA itself. And it turned out that when a messenger RNA had one of these premature termination codons, okay, uh, not only did you get aborted translation, but the messenger RNA itself became very unstable. And uh, we dubbed that process NMD, or nonsense-mediated mRNA decay. And Stu and I went on uh, to study this at great length, and, and my lab still does. Okay. And what NMD taught us was that this kind of termination codon, one that occurs sort of, let's call it in the interior, if you will, is very different from one that occurs in its appropriate place. Okay. And it turns out that these differences between premature and normal termination uh, were uh, obvious to us in other ways as well. So not only did we see differences in mRNA decay, but we saw differences in termination efficiency. What does that mean? It means that this was like a brick wall in terms of polypeptide synthesis. So if a ribosome came here, it all was terminated very efficiently at the normal terminator, but not so efficiently at the premature terminator. It was mechanistically different. And that was manifested as well when we studied the phenomenon of nonsense suppression, which is the read-through of a premature terminator and the insertion of an amino acid here, okay, we could find that we could get nonsense suppression in yeast at premature terminators, but we could never get them here. Okay? And so these two kinds of terminators had all the hallmarks of being mechanistically different. And so what we hypothesized was that, well, if they're different in yeast, and we can distinguish those differences by yeast genetic tricks, then damn it, we ought to be able to do it with small molecules. And perhaps, if we're lucky, if we could find a small molecule that would allow read-through of this but not this, perhaps we'd have a drug that could treat genetic diseases caused by nonsense mutations. And what's more, maybe the same drug could be used for disease A, B, C, D, and E. The argument being that the defect in the diseases we were comparing would be a defect in gene expression, not in disease physiology. And so we uh, started PTC Therapeutics and began by doing a high throughput screen, a, th a screen uh, in which we tested the ability of hundreds of thousands of molecules, uh, randomly chosen, to promote read-through of a premature termination codon in a reporter gene the firefly luciferase gene. Okay? And so the, the assay is very simple. Uh, you, you have a gene that's non-functional because of this premature termination codon, and you ask, are there compounds in the library of compounds that will give you luciferase activity, which for those of you who are familiar with this gene, know that that means light production that you can detect 
with automated devices. Okay? And this, of course, this high throughput screening is a very early stage in, uh, in the process of drug development. From there, you have to go on to lead optimization, then worry about toxicology, clinical development, and so on. And so um, I want to illustrate for you the, the process of lead optimization. And um, I, I have a few slides that, that explain it at the level of a, a teenage boy. And that's um, not because I expect a lot of teenage boys in the audience, but it happens to be where my personal maturation stopped. All right? Uh, so uh, that's coming up. All right? And so uh, we're going to, we're going to, um, uh, we did the screen, we got, uh, we got compounds from the screen, and then we had to optimize them. Uh, and optimization meant that we made 3,500 analogs and tested them. And testing them meant that we tested them first for nonsense suppression with luciferase assays. Okay? That was that luck gene I showed you. And then we tried them in real genes from two different diseases with nonsense mutations. And this was a mouse model of muscular dystrophy and a mouse model of cystic fibrosis. And then we did actual mice, uh, not, their, not just their cultured cells, but actual mice that had a model of muscular dystrophy and a model of cystic fibrosis. Then did some safety, and then we ended up with what's called a development candidate. And so this optimization process looked like this. So here's our original um, uh, scaffold that we found after comparing all of the hits from our screen. Okay? And it had activity, but not enough. And so we had to improve it somewhat to get it more, more activity, less toxicity. Okay? And uh, we had to make it look a little bit different to avoid any patent complications. Okay? And then we had to make it really potent okay? and much less toxic. So that's, um, that's chemical optimization using a slightly different model. Okay? At the end of the day, what we ended up with is a molecule we initially called PTC124 uh, and now call adalurin. Okay? It's a, a small molecule by all of the sort of standards we all talk about. 284 Daltons is small. Okay? Uh, and it leads to dose-dependent read-through okay, of all three premature stop codons, but does not affect normal stop codons. Okay? Uh, it doesn't matter what the gene uh, is doesn't matter where the mutation is located. Does not affect that NMD pathway that I told you about. Doesn't affect the levels of cellular mRNAs. Okay? And because some of you know that aminoglycosides have related effects, uh, it has nothing whatsoever to do with aminoglycosides. So a little bit of data. If we look at a reporter RNA that has a premature nonsense codon and treat with increasing amounts of adalurin, you can start to see that this truncated polypeptide is not the only thing you see in cells. You start to see the full-length protein, but you never see anything larger than full-length. If you start with the normal mRNA that lacks this sort of a stop codon, no matter how much adalurin you add, you never get this, um, this extended protein that would correspond to read-through of this stop. Okay? And so, at least in culture, the evidence was quite good that we only affected premature termination and not normal termination. And when we went to um, things other than cultured cells, other than the, um, the models, when we went to um, mouse, and, uh, mouse models of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis, we could demonstrate functional changes as well. Okay? So here we have mice that are treated uh, with adalurin and not treated, and you can start to see the dystrophin protein that's normally missing uh, starts to accumulate. And this is a test for loss of muscle strength. And in mice treated with the drug, the, there's a significant reduction in the loss of muscle strength. In a, a mouse model of cystic fibrosis, also with a nonsense mutation, the um, immunofluorescence for uh, the CFTR protein is absent in the control and present in mice treated with drug. 
the CFTR protein is a chloride channel. That means it pumps chloride ions out of cells. And in the absence of drug, we couldn't see chloride channel activity, but we could in the presence of drug. And so these sorts of things led us slowly but surely to the point of being able to do clinical trials. So the first clinical trial, of course, is a fa on phase one, where you ask, uh, is there any toxicity and what can you learn about dosing? And what we were trying to accomplish with dosing here was we were, based on our cell culture results and our mouse results, we were trying to get uh, blood levels in patients of between two and 10 micrograms per mil of drug. And what you see here is that patients treated three times a day with drug, and we don't need to go into dosing yet, okay? Uh, all I can tell you is that this is the lower dose and this is the higher dose, okay? You can see that in a very short time, this is four days of dosing, um, at either of these doses, we're having no trouble reaching the levels we were seeking, okay? And so the, the drug was orally bioavailable. We put this, uh, this powder, which is in a sachet, we pour it into a drink of the patient's choice. They take that drink three times a day. Uh, it's absorbed. We didn't see any uh, significant toxicities, nothing that we would call dose limiting. And we could go as high as 100 milligrams of drug per kilogram of body weight per day. And that's much more than we've ended up using. Okay? Importantly, we took blood from these patients and asked, do we see in these patients' cells any evidence for read-through of normal termination codons? A critical safety question. Okay? And here, um, we're looking at one of a half a dozen genes that we ended up examining where we made monoclonal antibodies for whatever peptides could appear in the three prime, if they were derived from the three prime UTRs of the mRNAs in question, and use those monoclonals to ask, do we ever see an extended peptide? And we did this with very small proteins so we could see significant differences, and we never see any extended proteins that went beyond the normal termination codon in any of our patient samples. So we were very happy, as you might imagine, about this result. So then from phase one, we went on to phase two experiments uh, with bona fide patients who had either Duchenne muscular dy dystrophy caused by a nonsense mutation or cystic fibrosis caused by a nonsense mutation. So here in this CF study, we have patients that are on um, a low dose of drug, four, four, and eight milligrams of drug per kilogram of body weight. Okay? Uh, Per, um, per, and and this, is, this is the dosage per day, so they get three doses a day, four, four, and eight, so a late dose is high. And so we have patients that are on drug at a low dose for two weeks, two weeks off drug, two weeks on high dose, and then after that, three months on either the low dose or the high dose. In another study, we, we had the, the same pattern, and then we flipped the pattern as well. Okay? And so, uh, here, we're looking at nasal swabs from one of those patients. And what we're looking at is uh, immunofluorescence from that nasal, nasal swab, indicating that we've made full-length uh, CFTR protein. You don't see it uh, prior to treatment, but you do see it uh, after treatment. And this was, in this case, 45 days after treatment. This was in the extension study. Importantly, we're seeing function as well. So I told you that the CFTR protein is a chloride efflux channel. So that means that if, uh, if chloride is being pumped out, uh, you should record negative current when an electrode is put into each nostril of the patient. And so here what we're looking for is uh, results heading in this direction as we're measuring chloride efflux. This is the trans epithelial potential difference. Okay. All the patients at the start of the trial uh, were either uh, near zero or positive, okay. what we call the abnormal range for chloride efflux. Okay. But in three months on drug, and each dot is a patient, you can see there's a progression towards more and more function of this chloride channel. And when 
the patients were taken off drug after three months, they all went back to their abnormal status. Okay? So very encouraging results. Likewise, uh, three other assessments of respiratory function gave us similar uh, uh, optimism. Uh, this is FEV, forced expiratory volume, FVC, forced vital capacity, and frequency of cough. A CF patient will cough as often as a thousand times a day. Okay? And so what you see here, again in the three-month trial, is that uh, the FEV, uh, although not showing any improvement in the first month, showed marked improvement over the next two months. And then when the patients were taken off drug, it dropped. Likewise for FVC, not much, if anything, in the first month. And then uh, substantial improvement after that that goes away off drug. And in cough frequency, uh, a two-month lag and then a loss of 200 coughs per day on average. Uh, not a trivial thing to a patient uh, with CF. Okay? So um, keep in mind that what we're trying to do here in these clinical trials is to say that the same drug if it's doing what we think it does, which is addressing the gene expression problem of premature termination, that that ought to work as well in different diseases. And so now I'm going to show you data from patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So in, in this four-week trial, we looked at three different doses. Uh, patients were on drug for four weeks and then off. Okay? And they were the same two uh, doses you saw in the CF trial, plus a, uh, a much higher dose. Okay? And um, we cultured uh, uh, myotubes uh, and, and myocytes from, from each patient, took, uh, took a biopsy at the beginning and the end of the trial, um, and asked whether or not we could detect dystrophin in the samples. Okay? And in about two-thirds of the patients, we could see staining for dystrophin that we couldn't see at the outset. And we could also see improvements in creatine kinase leakage into the serum. Uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy leads to damaged muscles, which leads to leakage into the serum. And amongst the things that leak into the serum is the enzyme creatine kinase. And so at all three doses, patients taking drug um, had a reduction in creatine kinase that went in the serum, that went away uh, when they were off drug. So before drug, on drug, off drug, and likewise. So at all three doses, we saw changes in creatine kinase activity. So these sorts of results and the uh, CF results led us to initiate phase 2B studies in DMD and phase 3 studies in CF. Okay? And I will show you the, the DMD data. So this is a double-blinded, uh, placebo-controlled trial in which the patients, the DMD patients, uh, received uh, either the high dose of 20, 20, 40 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or 10, 10, and 20, or placebo. This trial went on for uh, 48 weeks, almost a year. Okay? And the primary outcome measure was what's called a six-minute walk test. How far can an individual walk on a prescribed course over six minutes. Now, this is what the course looked like, and why is it important to do something like that? Well, progressive loss of walking ability uh, is, is a serious problem, and anything we could do to minimize that would be a, a, a significant uh, improvement for these patients. Okay? Uh, this is a, a test that's accepted by regulatory authorities, the data by this test are highly reproducible, and so that was our endpoint. Uh, our hypothesis was that one of our trial arms would improve uh, the uh, relative to placebo, the ability of these patients to do that six-minute walk test by 30 meters or longer. Okay, and the rest will uh, other statistical issues will skip. The uh, patients were stratified according to age, corticosteroid use, and six-minute walk test distance prior to the onset of the trial. And yeah, you should know that corticosteroids are those, sort of the 
uh, principal palliative treatment that are given to these patients, you know that steroids improve muscle mass to some extent, and this is the only thing that uh, prior to this uh, that has helped uh, these patients, but it certainly is no cure for muscular dystrophy. Okay? And so our different arms of the trial had essentially identical representation of all these different groups. And this is what it looked like after 48 weeks. Um, the low dose uh, had a 31.3 meter improvement relative to placebo, but the high dose had no effect whatsoever, perhaps even less than placebo. Um, P-value for the, the low dose was 0.028, but you have, because this is a two-arm trial, you have to double that, so it's a little over 0.05. Other uh, measurements in this trial also indicated that the low dose was effective. And so here we're measuring what's called a persistent 10% worsening. In other words, 10% uh, less ability to walk the distance you started at, okay, and maintaining that. And so what you see is that placebo and high dose uh, had, at the end of the trial, 40 plus percentage to uh, progressing to more than 10% worsening, and only 26% in the low dose. Likewise, the low dose looked uh, better than the high dose in what was called time function tests. So how long does it take a child to ascend four stairs, to descend four stairs, to run 10 meters, and so on. And uh, improvements are to the right. And so for example, um, point, uh, I mean 46% less means 46% uh, less time than placebo to do this particular test. And what you see, again, is that low dose does very well. So what's going on? Why low dose and not high dose? Okay. Turns out that the activity of this drug uh, has a bell-shaped uh, curve. So this is adalurin concentration. We're looking at dystrophin expression, and we're looking at dystrophin expression as monitored by immunofluorescence uh, relative to a control muscle protein. Um, and um, when we initially characterize the uh, efficacy of uh, atalurin in, in cultured myo uh, myocytes, uh, we pretty much had stopped around here and drawn a straight line this way. And so when we had these results from the clinical trial, we went back and obviously did this much further and we discovered this bell-shaped curve. And so as we go beyond 10 micrograms per mil, uh, this drug becomes less and less effective. Okay. Now that's interesting because we had, you'll recall, um, originally estimated that between 2 and 10 micrograms per mil would be our optimum for efficacy. And so we went back and looked at the clinical trial data relative to what patient sera had in their blood with regard to drug concentration. And we looked at patients both in the low dose and the high dose category. Okay? And so uh, almost all the low dose patients had at zero hour, that's before they get their first morning drug, uh, they had that concentration of less than 10 micrograms per mil. Okay, uh, but we uh, were also interested in what happened in, to, in the high dose patients. And so you have to realize that, uh, as was pointed out by Glenn this morning, uh, uh, clinical trials have heterogeneous uh, patient samples. And some of our uh, patients in the high dose arm of the trial had blood levels that were less than 10 micrograms per mil. And so if we lumped all the patients uh, on a graph where we looked at blood concentrations in micrograms per mil, you can see that the green ones are the patients from low dose, the 57 patients from low dose, and most of these are in the less than 10 micrograms per mil uh, level. But a few of those from the high dose, 17 of them, okay, 
also have low blood levels. Okay? And so we can then ask, well, what about performance by this group relative to that group? And it's much more impressive. And so if you look at the, uh, uh, the six-minute walk test uh, in, in patients that are on the uh, upper side of 10 micrograms per mil, it's pretty poor. But those in the 10 micrograms per mil or less arm uh, have only lost uh, 11 meters of walking relative to uh, where they started. And that's true in the much shorter data from the uh, extension trial as well. Now, another thing that we learned from the clinical trial, and this was the first real clinical trial of a drug for muscular dystrophy, and so we had a lot to learn about the natural history of the disease. So what we're looking at here are all the patients in the uh, placebo group where the beginning of the arrow is where they were at day one, and the head of the arrow is where they were 48 weeks later. Okay? And so you can see some patients uh, uh, decline very rapidly and some stay relatively stable. And so if you uh, look at these changes, okay, uh, some of these uh, indicate what are called um, maturational improvements. So these kids are relatively young, okay, and they start out with six-minute walk tests above 350 meters, and they don't drop off very quickly. Okay? Some of the older children, on the other hand, who have started out later um, with, with lower, I'm sorry, with lower six-minute walk test distances at the outset, drop very quickly. Okay? So what you, what you learn from this is that although we treated all the patients equally, um, this is not necessarily a population that responds uniformly, okay? something that, that complicates the interpretation of the trial. And so what happens if you break things down into subgroups is that you start to see results that are, again, uh, encouraging. And so here, if we look at the kids who only can do less than 350 meters at the start of the trial, the magnitude of the difference between them and placebo is more substantial. Or if you look at the kids that are less than nine years of age at the start of the trial, um, they barely uh, show any indication of a decline at all. Okay? And likewise for the kids who are on corticosteroids. Okay? So, not only is this giving us reason for optimism about the efficacy of the drug, but it's giving us new insights to how to run uh, trials uh, on, on Duchenne muscular dystrophy children. Okay. So um, what do we know? Uh, we know that uh, the drug is certainly well tolerated. We had very high, um, uh, we had very high uh, reliability of patients taking the drug. We had no one showing uh, any significant side effects that made them terminate the trial, for example. The low dose uh, gave us a, an approximately 30 meter difference in the six minute walk test, which is what we were looking for relative to placebo. Longer time to 10% worsening and positive trends in the, uh, in the time function tests. Uh, the high dose uh, is showing us uh, uh, no treatment effect whatsoever, and that's probably due to this bell-shaped dose response curve. And again, if we look at blood levels, there's an inverse relationship between blood levels and efficacy of the drug. Um, a couple of more general lessons that are pertinent to today is that um, this, is, this is a new treatment for genetic disorders. And it's about as personalized the personalized medicine as you can get. If you have a nonsense codon uh, in a gene that's required for something important, uh, you are a potential uh, patient who can use this. Okay? And there are, as I told you, many diseases for which this drug is likely to be relevant. Okay? 
This is a disease modifier. It's not a cure. All right? You have to take this drug for the rest of your life. Okay? And uh, it certainly could treat um, many life-threatening uh, disorders. Okay? Uh, another conclusion takes us back to the basic science. This drug is telling us that you've the original hypothesis that premature termination and normal termination were different mechanistically, that that probably has merit because this drug does not appear to have any effects on normal termination. Okay. Um, serendipity uh, refers to the fact that, that we started this project in yeast in a gene expression uh, study with uh, literally no initial interest in how this might be used for healthcare. Okay? Uh, we were interested in what termination codons did in gene expression, and in particularly, we, uh, we went on and, and focused a lot of our attention on, on messenger RNA decay. And it was only when we were sort of hit over the head with the uh, basic science result that premature termination codons and normal termination codons were not the same thing, that we sort of jump at the opportunity to see if we could do something um, therapeutic with that observation. But this is um, a, a, what I would think a really good example that says it sure is worth our while to continue studies of just plain old basic science, trying to understand how stuff works. Okay? Um, the other thing that I want you to take from this is that we studied, we started PTC Therapeutics in 1998. It's now 2012. Uh, this takes time and a lot of money. And, and so drug development uh, that we all are, you know, eager to get uh, involved in and to see move forward takes a while. It's an incredibly slow process. And it's, it's still slow to this day. We're now involved in the, the regulatory affairs end of all this, trying to see what it'll take to get our drugs approved. Okay? And that, too, is a, is a slow process. And so although there's reason to be hopeful here, uh, nothing in this realm happens quickly. And, and I urge you all who, who care about this sort of stuff to be patient. Uh, you know, angry, but patient. Right? And so um, I want to close with uh, one of my favorite paintings. This is 500 years old. Uh, this is a, a gentleman who's getting a hole drilled in his head. And I believe this funnel is going to be used to uh, serve as a delivery vehicle for whatever he's got in this vessel. Uh, this, this woman here is terribly impressed by these guys, as, as usual. The guys, the guys are something, doing something stupid, and the women are standing by moaning about what's going on. Um, the name of this patient, uh, the name of this painting is The Extraction of the Stone of Madness. Um, and I can tell you this works at home. I've done this on my kids. Uh, uh, works great. All right. Okay, so... Uh, I, I told you at the beginning that I, I've done this with Stu Peltz, a longtime collaborator. We worked together in yeast. We started PTC together. He's currently CEO uh, at PTC Therapeutics. Ellen Welch uh, was a grad student in my lab, and she runs the nonsense suppression uh, program at PTC. Uh, David Bedwell and Lee Sweeney were incredibly valuable in the uh, mouse experiments and in um, many other experiments related to um, uh, the, the analysis of samples uh, for suppression, in Lee's case of uh, DMD nonsense mutations, in Dave's case CFTR nonsense mutations. Uh, there's a huge team of chemists at PTC uh, who've been responsible for moving uh, all these analogs along, and then we have a very large number of investigators all over the world uh, who are involved in the clinical trials and, and generous support from numerous agencies. So thank you very much.